Going from poverty to self-sufficiency requires more than time on task. When poverty is accompanied by stress and even violence, there's a need for healing, or in other words, changing the narrative. One example of that is a memoir project for a group of women in the Boston area, helping them put their narrative into writing. We're staff members from the Crittenden Women's Union and a local writer best known as the author of the memoir, All Souls. We'd like to welcome Michael Patrick McDonald and one of the contributors to the project, Pamela Delaney, uh, thank you both for much being with us. Thank you. Thank you. I want to start with uh, Pamela. Tell me about your story before you, you started this project. Uh, before I started this project, I came from a single mom household. My mom grew up in the South. She had no clue of how to raise kids. Her idea was raising them, was controlling them, very abusive, physically and emotionally. And I was like the oldest daughter of four kids, four other kids. So I was left in the position of being the second mother and I had a lot of resentment toward my mother. On top of being controlling and abusive, she was obsessive with cleaning and very demanding, you know? At, at the same time, reading your memoir, uh, she, she wasn't just a tough lady. She was uh, a person who uh, really worked her way up on her own. Yes, I mean, yeah, yeah. she did. And that's one of the things that kept me sort of not totally hitting her, but the fact that she did want the best for us. We were all in Catholic schools. I know I was from like first grade up until senior year in high school. She worked several jobs to put us through there. And she did instill the um, importance of education in us, you know? But you came into this memoir project, I guess, at a, at a kind of a crossroads in your own life. What was going on? Um, I was um, on the verge of being homelessness, you know? You know? It was during the time before I went to Crittenden. And then when I went to Crittenden, I came in for a computer program class. But I ended up getting more out of that. They helped me go back to college, get my degree, and started working with um, the neighborhood, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Charter School, which was like a, a breakthrough in everything I wanted to do in life. You know, having been a single mom myself of two kids. It was like the, the backbone of everything I wanted, wanted to do. Michael, one of the first things people in the, the project did uh, was they, they read your m memoir. and. This isn't about somebody who wrote a book about the past. This is also about healing from trauma. Right, and it's, it's about um, finding a voice, taking that traumatic stuff and turning it into something useful in the world and uh, something, you know, and turning it into a meaningful life. I mean, the work Pam's doing in her own community now is also part of that. This is all finding your voice. But uh, we talk a lot about finding your voice on the page and off the page as well. And really finding voice is about finding agency in the world. And, and the best way to do that when you come from a life of Poverty and trauma, I mean, you know, poverty, the trauma of poverty is constant for a lot of people, you know, so it's not one big trauma. So a lot of people have post-traumatic stress, and the best way to work with that really is to, to reconstruct the story, to tell the story, and to imagine the rest of the story. And also to turn that into your kind of life mission and what you're doing in your community and in your life. Yeah, when I read your memoir, your voice, it sounds like Proust. I'm, here I am, I'm in bed. I'm thinking... <laughs> <laughs> and it is so true. I mean, this is my daily routine, you know, because growing up, like I said, in one of my pieces, I mentioned my mom's living room. That was like totally, totally off limits to us, you know. We were like confined to this extra room she had, or our bedroom, you know. And so once I got my apartment, you know, it's like, although I have my living room, I make it kid friendly, I'm still not as comfortable in there, but I still hear her voice screaming at me about coming in there. And so and then my room was just, I just like the sanction. I get to think about my day, what went wrong, how can I improve on myself, I mean, things I've said that, to people that maybe I shouldn't have said, you know? Now, you, you, uh, you touched something in your mother's room, uh, a favorite object, um, and you cracked it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've cracked a few things in that little room. <laughs> but that was one of her, like, prized possessions. And I... Yes, the thank her. And I loved it. I mean, it was like this statue that sat on the floor. I said, the couch was like all terry cloth. Everything was blue, crystals and trinkles everywhere. And I was just totally attracted to it. And I picked it up and I didn't realize how heavy it was, you know? Right, Michael, I, I think a lot of us, whether we're rich or poor, we, we've grown up in houses where there was one room that was better mm. than all the others. And you had to be really careful when you went in there. Uh, stuff like this, is this, some people say, well, that's too ordinary. Why, why are we writing about that? <laughs> because I think I think it's it's where Pam found her way to forgive her mother and to um, you know to acknowledge that there was a lot of mean stuff going on, but also to try to understand 
her own mother's uh, situation, coming from the Jim Crow South, herself being poor, single mother, and so forth. It doesn't mean you completely absolve people of any of the harm that they've done, but but there's this um, there's this forgiveness in Pam's piece that is really moving to me. I think um, that also her her own Pam's own children have come to her readings of this story, and that's been a really incredible thing to see because they they weren't as familiar with this story as they they now are. And so, um, and one of the things I'm paying a lot of attention to these days is generational trauma, how things can be passed down, how the trauma we lived with can be passed down to later generations. I've seen that with the children and grandchildren of the All Souls generation. Um, these are a lot of the young people that are on painkillers. Um, and so the way we break that is to have this communication with our children about the trauma we come from. The silence doesn't work. It, it, it'll just perpetuate trauma. And so one of the most beautiful things I've seen through this project is the involvement. You know, Pam's daughter's here today. She shows up with her. She's very proud of her mother. Um, and, and that's been one of the most beautiful things I've, I've been able to witness here. Pam, I, I know in your memoir, there were times when you talked to your mother afterwards that there was not any tension in the air. But did you ever talk to your mother saying, Mom, do you remember that time when you did that to me? You came after me with the belt. Did, did you ever have that, hash that yes, out with her? Yes, I've tried that conversation years ago. And I realized then that she was still somewhat in denial. In her mind, it was something she had to do. I mean, and it was like, and she sort of brings it back to, well, I did the best I could, you know? And, I'm, and I used to question, I'm like, well, Mom, I'm not questioning your best. I'm just questioning how it affected me. Mm -hmm. And I think at that time, she was not ready to hear it, you know? Because it was like, it was still left, like, left alone. Like, okay, I did this. Get over it, move on, you know? And, so I, and to this day, I still can't have that conversation with her because now she's battling Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So I'm like stuck in this situation where, okay, I need to resolve this, but I can't resolve it with the person who I need to resolve it with. So what I've done now is just totally forgiven her, you know, and just move on for my own sake. Yeah, and, and the way you write the memoir, at the end, you talk about a really pleasant time. You're at Friendly's. She says, you can have anything you like. Yes. Yeah. And that's what keeps me going with her, you know, because that was... As mean as she was, there were those few times, you know, that it was just me and her. I could be that little child that I wanted to be, instead of being the provider, the big brother, the big, the big sister to my brothers and sisters. So it was that time where it was just me and her. You know what I mean? She would leave my younger sister to take care of my younger brother. And I was like, that was a real break. And I just enjoyed those times. That's what sort of I, when I get angry at her, I think about those times. Michael, how important is that putting a name in a problem? There was another participant who wrote about being a victim of a domestic abuse and it took her a long time to, to name that mm -hmm. and get out of the relationship. Uh, how does the memoir process help with that? It's important because it allows you to see that you know, this, this stuff really happened, to acknowledge that it really happened, and also to acknowledge that some of the things we've experienced are not normal. These aren't the things, this isn't the way we're supposed to live, you know. So for me, writing All Souls, I experienced that, you know, when you put it on the page and you step back and you're like, wow, this is, um, these are atrocities, you know what I mean? And you, 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 you name it, you name it as trauma, and you start to understand that if you feel messed up in this life, it's probably because you should feel a little messed up and then you can work on that, you know, and you know where it's coming from whenever you do feel a little bit messed up from PTSD or whatever. Pamela, yeah, what's also <clears throat> changing in your life is that before you were doing clerical work and now you're, you're I guess, getting closer to your dream of working with at-risk yes. young people. Mm. How's that going? It's going great because my, um, I work at the school through a merit corps in Delhi, Delhi Promise Corps, and I've been there like two this years. This is the Delhi Neighborhood School. Correct? Yes, and it's, it's amazing, you know. I see these kids, and they remind me mm -hmm. so much of me. From that one of the girls I work closely with, she's like a miniature of me. I was an angry child. I would lash out in school, in my after-school program, because I was so angry. And I've gotten to the point where we have that relationship. I mean, she still breaks out a little bit, but it's like now it's more under control. Yeah. When she gets to that point, she will come to me and say, Miss Delaney, I need help, you know? Can we go for a walk? And to me, that is, like, mm. amazing. I don't want anybody, if I can help it, to go through and live with the trauma of abuse, you know? Growing up, as a, growing up, you know? Something that they didn't ask for, but just because their parents don't know any better, you know? Thank you both very much Thank for being with us. For the Crittenton Memoir Project, uh, Pamela Delaney and Michael Patrick McDonald. Thank you. Thank you so much.